The story of the formation of stars is something that astronomers have been trying to piece together for quite some time. And this is largely because the stars themselves are shrouded in secrecy. I mean literally enshrouded in secrecy. We know, for example, that stars are points of light and they are composed of hydrogen and helium gas. However, when we look around the night sky, we see mostly the points of light. We seldom see the gas itself. Well, that's because the gas is quite cool. If you look at the constellation of Orion, you'll see there's a relatively small patch of that gas that is glowing, kind of like a fluorescent lamp. But if we could look into the same region with infrared eyes, we would see all of that cool gas known as the Orion Molecular Cloud. Let's take a closer look, however, at the Orion Nebula. Let's take a closer look at the near infrared. So you can see those very hot, bright stars at the center. The, these stars are called the trapezium. And surrounding the trapezium are these tinier red little points of light. Well, these points of light look like stars, but they're not quite stars just yet. They are, in fact, protostars. So protostars are really just the cores of collapsing molecular clouds. We have clouds within the clouds, within the clouds, and tiny clumps form, and they collapse. As they collapse, they heat up, so they release a great deal of infrared radiation. Now, the cores themselves are hot, but they're not yet hot enough to cause hydrogen to fuse into helium through thermonuclear fusion. And this is just because the temperatures and the pressures are building, but they haven't yet reached that critical mass or that critical pressure to trigger hydrogen fusion. So let's take a look at the broad steps of star formation. We initially begin with a cloud, and the cloud is consisting of moving molecules of gas. So that means that there's a pressure in the cloud, and despite the fact that the cloud has some mass to it, rather than just collapsing under its own gravity, it's kind of repelled from doing that by virtue of the motions of the particles themselves. So pressure overcomes its mutual gravity. But something happens, something triggers the formation of little clumps of gas and dust somewhere in the middle of these clouds. Now these dense clumps have mass and therefore they have gravity. Now gravity starts to overtake the pressure, right? It starts to overtake the motions of the molecules. And so as clumps form, then little cores form inside the clumps. And these cores are essentially the protostars. They gain mass and therefore the gravitational pull of these cores increases. So there now becomes a bit of a snowball effect and this has the effect of accelerating the collapse. But as the cloud collapses, it's rotating and this causes the disk to flatten out. So now we formed what's called a circumstellar disk. And we can think of the disk as an inner disk, which directly feeds the protostar. So this sometimes is called an accretion disk, or also called a protostellar disk. And the remaining outer disk flattens eventually and becomes what's called a protoplanetary disk. So eventually we would expect planets to form inside this disk, and at some point the star itself, the protostar, turns on. In other words, the pressures and the temperatures are now high enough that suddenly we can have thermonuclear fusion in the core, and this produces tremendous fast winds that help sweep out the disk as well as the planets themselves. They collect all the debris in their path, and the planetary system is now born. The star is a proper planetary system. So a main driver of the story is the fact that the entire cloud and subsequent disk and the stars themselves are all rotating. And whenever we think of something that's rotating, it's important to consider a quantity called angular momentum. All objects in motion have momentum, and if the object is rotating, we call that rotational momentum or, more properly, angular momentum. And angular momentum depends on three things. It's a product of the mass of the rotating body, the rotational velocity, or the angular velocity, the rate at which it's rotating, and also how spread out the mass is. Now, angular momentum has a certain property, and namely that 
it's a conserved quantity. In other words, it's always going to remain constant even if we were to somehow change one of the three parameters. So when a figure skater is spinning, if she has her arms spread out, she rotates relatively slowly, but as she brings her arms in, she rotates faster. This is how the angular momentum is conserved. Her mass doesn't change, so what has to change? It's her rotational velocity. So what does this have to do with stars again? Well, remember, stars are forming out of these giant molecular clouds, and there are thousands of them spread out just within our galaxy alone. Each of these molecular clouds has the mass of anywhere from a couple thousand to up to a million suns, and they are spread out over hundreds to thousands of light year. So even though these clouds are rotating very slowly, each of them contain a tremendous amount of angular momentum. So there needs to be something to get these giant molecular clouds to begin collapsing. For example, uh, clouds can just randomly collide, and that can get a couple of rotating clouds to combine together, forming clumps and increasing the rotational velocity. Massive stars can explode as supernovae, and these can send shock waves through interstellar space. If these shock waves collide with a giant molecular cloud, that can cause that cloud to fragment and collapse into multiple stars. Or, in a kind of a chicken and egg scenario, we can have what we see here. The presence of these very young, massive stars at the center of this nebula can trigger star formation by flooding the entire region with ultraviolet radiation and super fast stellar winds that kind of slam into the denser, cooler gas around it, forming these tight knots and clumps. And each of the clumps that you see here in this image are the cocoons of a young forming protostar within. And when stars are reaching the end of their formation stages, they often go into what's called a Titari star phase. So we're talking about stars that are about the same mass of the sun, and they aren't yet fusing hydrogen in their cores yet, but they're about to. And Tistari stars are often characterized by the presence of circumstellar disks and by these very fast stellar winds. So in this image, we're looking at V1331 Cygni. The circumstellar disk is seen more or less face on. And if we could take an imaginary view of this same disk kind of at an angle, You'll see what's going on. What's happening is that the protostar is emitting a very fast stellar wind. But the disk itself is made of such cool, dense gas and dust that it has the effect of confining the outflow of that stellar wind pretty much along the axis of its own rotation. In other words, the outflow is basically being channeled out through the poles. Now sometimes this outflow is very intense. And when we look in places like the Carina Nebula, remember every one of these knots, every one of these clumps is a forming star system in and of itself. However, when we look into the upper right corner of this image, you'll see that there's a very pronounced jet of material that's blasting out in a bipolar fashion. Now, when this stuff is being ejected out at very high speeds, this has the effect of getting rid of some of that angular momentum. And that's important because if the star were to somehow keep all of its angular momentum, it would have to rotate so fast that it would literally tear itself apart. And when this material slams into the surrounding dust and nebulosity, it ionizes that gas and it causes it to glow. So these jets, these glowing jets, are known as herbig harrow objects. And they're really just the high-velocity jets slamming in at hundreds of kilometers per second. Now, we think these are relatively short-duration events. In other words, we don't think that these last very long, maybe on the order of a couple thousand, maybe to a hundred thousand years or so. But remember that the formation of these stars take place over tens of millions of years. Now, we're lucky here. We get to actually see both lobes of the jet. Oftentimes, however, we have a very dense pillar of gas in this particular case that's blocking one of those jets from view. Luckily, though, we can explore this region at infrared and submillimeter wavelengths. That allows us to see through much of that blocking gas and dust, revealing both lobes in the process. So these Herbig-Harrow objects, 
really seem to herald the arrival of a newly forming star. So this is a very well studied object, HH30. Uh, it may not look very impressive because we are looking at the individual pixels on the Hubble Space Telescope's main camera, but there are still some very familiar features. First of all, we have the jet, which is being emitted at a rate of about 300 kilometers per second. There's also a lot of light from the star itself being reflected or scattered from the disk. Now the disk itself is in silhouette, and that's because deep at the center is the protostar itself hidden from our view. And to keep the scale in mind, let's just consider the radius of this disk. It's about 430 astronomical units. Remember, the semi-major axis of Neptune is about 30 astronomical units. So this is an extremely, still an extremely very, very large system that is still in the process of collapsing. So what we think is happening is that the star itself is about to switch on and there are presumably planets inside this disk that are forming from the disk material itself. Best of all, we can take images of these phenomena over and over again, and over a 14-year period, this particular jet was captured by the Hubble Space Telescope, so we can actually watch how it moves through space. We don't have to pretend or assume that this is happening. We can see it happening over time. Now, we only have one of the two jets. The other jet would be moving toward the left of your screen. However, it's concealed behind a dense molecular cloud. So we have a story that we're starting to fit together about how stars form. There are these protostellar or protoplanetary disks that surround newly forming stars, and it seems that every star that forms starts out with a disk like this. But not all of these disks have jets associated with them. So the jets themselves are probably transient events. In fact, if you look at this object on the right side of your screen, you're going to see little knots. It's almost as if there were like bullets of material that were being ejected from the star. So this tells us that the jets themselves probably turn on and turn off and turn back on again at various times throughout the star's formation. So, quick anatomy and recap. We have the circumstellar disk. All this is the rotating gas and dust, and it's flattening out due to the conservation of angular momentum. The inner disk is rotating the fastest, and therefore it's the flattest part of the system. This inner disk is what directly feeds the protostar, and that's why it's often called an accretion or a protostellar disk. The protostar itself is hidden from view, it's directly at the center, and it's this disk that confines the outflow of the protostellar wind along the poles, and sometimes the outflow is intense enough to create a jet. So far we've been talking about the formation of stars that are approximately the mass of the sun, but it turns out the same phenomena is true even of massive stars like this one. Uh, this is a 15 solar mass star called Sharpless 2-106, and as the picture may indicate, it's the same process just happening on a much, much larger scale. So we have the protostar itself, which is basically hidden from view. We don't really even see the protostar, but this massive bipolar outflow, and you could just see all the different knots that suggest how the stuff has been colliding with the interstellar medium. So this whole system is about two light years from one end to the next. So this is just the same thing that happened to our solar system, except obviously on a much larger scale. Now, most of the stars in the sky are actually members of binary systems. So here is an example of a forming binary system. This is HK Tauri, and we have two separate disks. So we have two stars, each forming from within their own disks. And since these two disks and the two protostars within are gravitationally bound, they will undoubtedly go on to become a proper binary star system. These disks and the stars forming within them will continue to orbit one another. But sometimes a binary, or even in this case, a triple star system, can form from within the same disk. What we have is a single disk, and it looks like what's happened is that the disk has fragmented. And it's this fragmentation of the disk that gave rise to additional clumps or additional cores. 
So here's an artist impression of a similar system, GG Tari A. It looks like we had the primary star at the center, and then from somewhere within the disk, some instability formed, and rather than accreting onto the main star at the center, it formed its own accretion disk around a second protostar. As the protostar continues to develop, the remaining disk is flattening, and then little clumps form inside that disk and go on to become planets. So we're going to learn more about the formation of planetary systems next.